It's about you understanding old age, sickness, and death. That how all of us in this class will run away from these three realities, go back to our kingdom, and live in the cradle of pleasure. This kid named Siddhartha, who will later become the Buddha, you need to have a great amount of respect for this kid some 3,000 years ago. At the age of 19, he wakes up, he sees Gregory, and he says, oh my God, why does he look like that? He goes to Greg and says, Greg, what happened to your face? Said, what do you mean? Well, you have wrinkles around your eyes. Can't you fix it? Why don't your head? It's all gray. Why do you walk so slow? I'm old. Oh. If this is difficult to grasp, go back to when your parents sat you down in hopes of trying to knock some sense into your pathetic little head. And eventually they walked away with a great amount of frustration. <laughs> 3,000 years ago, a kid at the age of 19 looks at someone who is a little older and all of a sudden experiences yoga. He emerges with old age. He sees himself in old age. And it's devastating. If this is a little difficult for you to grasp, go to a funeral. And what you experience is the intensity of the mother weeping because of her son has passed, or a daughter has passed, or a wife weeping because a husband has passed, and now she doesn't know what to do with herself. The longing, the yearning, the sorrow, the pain is so intense and so consuming that you are left in paralysis. You sit there, and even though complete strangers, you begin to cry. Your life becomes hollow and meaningless. But you have this merging that will last for no more than half hour. And as you're sitting, trying to soak up this experience, and you think it's going to be transformative, all of a sudden, your cell phone rings like rebels. And all of a sudden, you come out of this trance, you look, and it's Gillian. It says, honey, I miss you. I'm waiting for you. I'm ready for you. And all of a sudden, you look at this weeping mother, you say, what the hell am I doing here? You get in your car, and you run through Gillian. Even though the Buddha lived in the cradle of pleasure, he couldn't run away from the experience of old age. You know why? It's a marriage. Very, very difficult to divorce. It's not that you can't walk away. What the hell do you do with the history? What are you going to do with the guilt? With the shame? You have no idea how it feels to be single again. You've been called a husband, a father for the past 40 years. What are you going to walk away from? How? The books don't say the Buddha tried to forget this experience, but he is a human being. And he is subject to very basic principles of life. Pleasure is the driving force of life. He wants to go back, but he can't. 
old age, the experience of it, has a leash around his neck. And for those of you in this class who have ever been touched by a life event that has created a good amount of pain inside you, what do you do? You call a friend, you go to a parent, you read the Bible in hopes of an answer. But you realize all the libraries in this world will never be able to provide an answer for you. You'll come to realize, as Freud suggested a long time ago, that you go to your father because he is your hero. You ask him, Dad, what the hell do I do with old age? And for the first time you realize your dad can't really give you an answer. He is your hero no more. He's fallen from grace. He can give you food. He can give you shelter. He can give you clothing. But he can give you psychological, emotional nourishment. You go to your mom and you feel that she too has failed you. And for the first time you realize something devastating. You are psychologically orphaned. You must travel through life all alone when it comes to issues psychological, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. So he has an open wound, and he's hoping that this wound will close and heal so he can go back to his life. But then he runs into Greg. He already knows Greg is old, but now he sees something brand new in Greg. He's coughing. He's limping. He says, why are you coughing? I'm getting sick. What the hell does that mean? Greg is old. And as Freud would say, your body becomes your worst enemy. Mentally, you're young. You think you can run like Sonic, really, really fast. And the moment you try to run fast, you realize, oh, my knee, oh, my hip, my shoulder, oh, my nose is falling off like Michael Jackson. He has a Lamborghini, but he's too sick to get into it, to drive it. Because now with old age, he has a vision problem. And the Buddha says, really? I go through all of life. I buy myself a three-story house. I buy myself a Ferrari. I buy myself all the stuff, only to get old, only to get sick. And gang can't get to the bedroom because it's on the third goddamn floor. And I can't get into the Ferrari because it's too low, too close to the ground. And I can't drive at night. What's the use of pursuing anything physical if sickness will force you to look at them and just feel lost? You may think that this is a story of a guy from 3,000 years ago. That's not true. It happens to everybody at all times. And then, of course, there is the third and final reality. He goes out. For those of you in this class who have seen Godfather Part 3, the very, very, very end of the movie. Take a quick glimpse of Al Pacino, Godfather, in part one, and then part two, and then see him having Asian a little bit in part three, and then fast forward to the very ending of the movie. He's sitting in this courtyard. It's no longer lush, really. Most of the shrubs have 
die. Al Pacino is really, really old. He's sitting on a chair in the middle of the courtyard. It's sunny, it's probably hot. And all of a sudden, he just collapses. And his glasses fall to the ground. How could it happen? A young godfather, he has all this power. He plays in part one, part two, part three. He's full of life. And at the end, he just dies. And what happens when somebody dies? All of us in this class have lost people. I lost my grandfather, my grandmother, my father-in-law. My father is 90, soon I will lose him. My mother is 80, soon I'm going to lose her. In the end, you know what's going to happen. Once in a while, I'll flip through the pictures. I say, oh, that was my mom, I remember her. ما می رویم و عکس ما می ماند این عجب بین که کار دنیا بر عکس است All that will remain of you and I is a picture That's all. Now we've talked about old age, sickness and death in regards to people But it's much more subtle and much more frightening, much more horrific. It's an example of use for the past 40 years. I like coffee. I like it very much. This is my fifth or sixth or tenth cup. I forget. When I brewed this at 5.50, I took a sip and it was delicious. It was new. It made me come to life. It inspired me. drank a few more sips, it's no longer as exciting, no longer inspires me, it just sits there. And I drink it not because I want to drink coffee, I drink it because my throat, my mouth is dry. It has gotten old, the experience, and when the class is over, and all the nights after I leave this class, I will dump it in that garden. It's dead to me. Every single one of you in this class are going to feel the same exact thing with experiences. It doesn't matter what they may be. You may come to life by buying a brand new car. You may wash it every goddamn day, and I assure you, on the third week, you won't wash it. On the fifth week, you will throw gum in it. You will trash it. there comes a point where you won't care for it. There is nothing that you do in life that will not get old. There is nothing that you will do in life that will not sicken you. And there is nothing that you will do in life where you will come to a place where you realize you become completely indifferent to the thing that once gave you life, excitement, inspiration. Do you see how tragic this philosophy is? Next time someone says, I'm a Buddhist to you, slap it. No one can be a Buddhist. As no one can be a Hindu. As no one can be a Gilgamesh, as no one can be a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian, far too painful.
And there is this beautiful story in Buddhism about a man and just walking around, he's having a good time, and all of a sudden an arrow with a poisonous tip goes into his back. And people, you know, they usually become profoundly compassionate and kind when we see someone in pain. So this man is picked up, taken to the hospital, and the doctor is about to pull the arrow out. And the man says, no, before you pull the arrow out, what's the color of the arrow? And the doctor says to him, are you stupid? You're bleeding. The arrow is poisonous. Let me get the arrow out. Nope. What's the color? It's red. Again goes to pull the arrow out. The wood. Is it cherry? Is it walnut? Is it redwood? What the hell kind of wood is this? The doctor says, don't be so stupid. Nope. I need to consent to you pulling the arrow out. I'm not going to consent unless you tell me the make of the wood. All right, it's walnut. Again, he goes to pull the arrow. What's the width of the arrow? Five feet. What's the length of the arrow? 20 feet. Is the tip made of aluminum, stainless steel, or steel? And then he dies. There is an arrow in all of our backs, old age, sickness, and death. It moves through our veins very, very, very slowly. None of us in this class notice the poison slowly moving through our bodies. The four of us in this class who have some age will tell you, we have no idea at one point we got to be 50 and then 60. There is a movie that came out some years ago with Michael Douglas, Morgan Friedman, and a few other folks, and I think it's called, it's called something. So they're, uh, you know, they've been friends for about 40 years. They met each other when they were in their 20s, and now they're each like 60, 70, 80. And Michael Douglas, who's still quite handsome, He's in this room with his buddies, and all of a sudden, he gets really, really, really angry. And he screams, when did it happen? When did I get to be 75? That's the poison. And if you want to understand what the teachings of the Buddha is all about, it's really quite simple. The Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Steps, they're there for one simple reason. Remember, if you've seen the movie, Remember the Titans? There's a scene. I want you to block every move they make. Tonight, they must remember the Titans. The Buddha's teachings are really meant for only one reason. Remember old age, sickness, and death. If you remember them, and remember them well, and the only way to remember is to fight against forgetfulness. To fight against forgetfulness is to beware of the temptations of pleasure. It's not about enlightenment, seeing gold, having no body. That's rubbish. Because even if you have an out-of-body experience, you will have to come back to your body and live in a physical life.
for those of you in this class who have watched Judge Judy a few times, she has this beautiful, beautiful saying. Keep it simple, stupid. Buddhism is a very simple but profound philosophy. Don't make it complicated. Don't read books that make Buddhism complicated. The Indian philosopher sage Krishnamurti had this wonderful saying as well. To be intelligent is to be simple. Don't hide behind elaborate and profound concepts, wordy concepts. They mean nothing. So again, remember, to be able to marry old age, you have to be at a really, really right place in life. You can be 20, you can be inspired by the philosophy of Buddhism, but if you're not in the right place, it remains inside you as an idea or a concept, that's all. And if you go back to our conversation about teacher-student, the task of a teacher is to force you to remember, to get you pregnant with ideas that are transformative. So human beings live two lives, physical, psychological. The Buddha lived his physical life for 19 years. One morning he wakes up and he realizes he has this other part to him, the psychological part, that has needs, different kinds of nourishments that the physical world can't give. How do I deal with old age? Do I go on a diet? How do I deal with sickness? Do I do yoga? How do I deal with death? Should I buy a good coffin? Old age, sickness, and death, their presence and their remembrance only have one function. If you're able to be mindful of old age, sickness, and death, you will know how to live wide alive in your physical body. That's its only function. And if you become really proficient, reflection that causes pain becomes a source of enjoyment. Through reflection caused by pain, you gain insights. And those insights may force you to feel different about yourself, and you will like it. Aristotle had once argued that there are two kinds of loneliness in this world. One that turns you into a god, and one that turns you into a beast. When you're broken at a very young age because of a father figure or a mother figure because you fell in love at the age of 12 and your heart got broken and you vowed never again to fall in love always be detached, always be far away. Never allow anyone to hurt you. You will become a beast, a savage, because deep down you desire companionship. Deep down you desire faith, you desire trust, you desire love. But because you've become a beast, you have lost those abilities. You're lonely not because you're self-sufficient, you're lonely not because you're healthy. You're lonely not because you can keep your own company. You're lonely because you don't trust anyone, including yourself. The flip side is, 
you become like the Buddha. What do people give you? They give you pleasure. What lives inside pleasure? Forgetfulness. What happens in forgetfulness? Time slips away. And one day you catch yourself having gotten old. And then you, very much like Gilgamesh, you walk away from the riches of the world. And you say, no. Even when Siduri, the cosmic barmaid, who gets Gilgamesh drunk and says to him, go back to your world. Get married. Enjoy love. Enjoy sex. Enjoy companionship. Have children. Enjoy their presence. And Gilgamesh says, no. I have loved. I know what the world does to the people you love. The world destroys them, kills them, and then you're left all alone. I want to love something that the world can't touch. I want wisdom. I want understanding. And Siduri says, fine. What you want can be found in the world or its occupants. Move on through your journey. You'll be fine. When you realize that you keep talking to your friends about old age, sickness, death, about time, about life, about meaning, and none of them understand, gradually you will learn to walk away from them. And you will find companionship in reading, in hiking, in biking, in reflecting, in writing. And before you know it, you realize you have spent 10 hours of your day in your room alone thinking, writing, enjoying your own company. Who does that? God. Because God has no need for anyone except himself. And that's what you've done. There is a story about Idris Shah. He is... A Sufi philosopher, a Muslim Sufi philosopher that died, uh, I think, in the 1980s. He has a story, and he's written maybe, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 books out there. And they're really, really, really good. I don't know if you can find a PDF for these books free. But you can certainly go to Amazon um, and order some of his books, Learning How to Learn, Commanding Self, uh, and some other books, Idris Shah. In one of the books, he says, he was sitting in his room, and he was writing for three weeks without ever stepping outside. And after three and a half weeks, he said, I just needed to go outside and just see people, not to talk to them. I just want to go out and feel my own existence in a different way. He goes out, has some coffee, has some lunch, and then goes back home and writes. The woman, J.R. Rolkin, Rolkin, what's her name, who does that? You know. Rowling. Rowling. JT? JK. JK Rowling? Yeah. You know what she does, right? You know how she writes her books. She's very rich right now. So when she's inspired to write a book, a continuation of all the stories, she reserves a room in a really, really fancy hotel, like a thousand bucks a night. And she just goes in there, locks the door for six months, and she just writes. I mean, just think about that for a moment. To have a fertile imagination, where what you imagine, they are your companion. Now, regardless of what you may think about her writings, the very fact that someone can lock themselves up in a room and write every single day for six months without the need of anyone's company. Now, 
that is a life worth living. Now, that is called solitude. Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. How are you doing? How were your travels? I just came back three days ago. And I'm going to Canada in two days. You're what? I'm going to Canada in two days. What do you mean? And now you're going to leave? Yeah. For where? Yeah. For what? Vacation. <laughs> Vacation? There is no place to rest. There is no vacation to be had. Unless you just unreflected. But you're not. It's very good to see you.